So there were these two girls, students, Christian students from Wales, and they'd come to have dinner with us here, not uh, over where we live. And uh, as we chatted about this and that, uh, I happened to mention William Williams Pantakelin. As often happens in our house, yeah, frequent topic of conversation. Now, my wife tells me that I'm not always aware of other people's reactions. But even I couldn't miss the blank look on the faces of these two girls. Uh, who? And then one of them said, rather tentatively, Bread of heaven, you mean? Well, yes, I, I suppose I should have been relieved that she'd got that much, right? I wouldn't say that I was disappointed with their lack of knowledge. I would say I was flabbergasted. <laughs> I was even gobsmacked. Can I, can I, am I allowed to say that? I, can, I, I was gobsmacked. Christian students from Wales, it was absolutely gobsmacking <laughs> Smack, well, yeah. that, that they should know so little about this man. Now, William Williams, of course, is so much more than bread of heaven. Uh, he is one of the most remarkable figures in the history of Christianity in Wales, in fact, he's one of the most influential figures in the whole history of Wales, full stop. He's rarely given his full name. Very often he's known as just Williams Pantakelin, or simply as Pantakelin. That's what we'd probably call him this afternoon. Why Pantakelin? Why was he given this name? Some of you know, others of you don't know, but some of you like to guess. Why was he given this name Pantakelin? The farmhouse. It's the farmhouse. You've been there. Farmhouse. With whom? The yeah, with me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the name of the farm where he lived for most of his life. Not where he was born, but where he lived for most of his life. What does it mean? What does Pantakelin mean? Holly is a kelly, yes, we are, yes. Pant is a hollow. So it really means holly hollow, which is quite an interesting name in itself. Holly hollow, all right? Where is it? Where is it? What's the nearest town? Llandavry. Llandavry. Uh, it's, it's close to the hamlet of Pentre T. Gwyn, about a mile or two out of Llandavry on the way to Brecon in northern Carmarthenshire. It is still owned by his descendants, and they are always glad to welcome visitors. It must be the most visited house in the whole of Wales. Let's take a brief look at his life. He was born exactly 300 years ago. Don't know exactly when, but 300 years ago, into a strongly nonconformist farming family. He intended to become a doctor, but is around 20, his life was changed as he heard Howell Harris preaching in Talgarth Churchyard. Now then, where's Talgarth? Near Treveca. Near Treveca. You're, you're quite right. Yes, you're quite... Where's Treveca? <laughs> Near Talgarth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, between Brecon and Hayonwai, roughly. Um, yes. Why was Howell Harris preaching in the churchyard? Why wasn't he preaching in the church? Too many people. Too many people. Too many people. No, not too many people. Not in this case. At the work, it, he wasn't allowed to. He wasn't an ordained clergyman, so he preached 
outside the church building in the churchyard. Listen to Pantle Kellin's account, dramatic account of what happened that day. This the morning I'll remember. I myself heard heaven's call. I received a fearful summons from the highest court of all. In response to that divine summons, he came to true faith in Jesus Christ. And he committed himself to the service of his new master. He retained an interest in medicine because his aim was to become a doctor. He retained an interest in medicine throughout his life. But his great desire from now on was to heal souls rather than bodies. Do I hear bells ringing? Yes, Martin. Martin who? You're, you're, you're quite right. Yes, Martin. Lloyd George. Lloyd George. Yeah, well, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, among others who followed a similar path. Probably through the influence of Howell Harris, Pantacarin was ordained deacon in the Church of England. And he was appointed a curate in the Llanurtid area, which is between Llandovery and Bilth Wells. But because of his Methodist activities, he was refused ordination as a priest. He decided to remain in the Church of England and commit himself to working with the Methodist movement within the church in close association with Daniel Rowland. So we have Howell Harris, through whom he was converted, Daniel Rowland, the man he worked with, and William Williams Pantakelly. And these three were the main leaders of the revival associated with Welsh Calvinistic Methodism in the middle of the 18th century. All three were powerful preachers of the gospel. Sometimes we forget that with Pantakelly, we think of his hymns and so on. We forget he was a powerful preacher of the gospel himself. This is what Howell Harris says of him, and I like this. Hell trembles when Brother Williams comes, <laughs> and souls are daily taken by him in the gospel net. No less important was his wise pastoral work, especially in super supervising the, the Sayadai, the societies where converts were instructed in the faith and helped to understand what had happened to them, helped to understand their spiritual experiences because they were converted out of the world, as we would say. His willingness to travel, to preach the gospel and to visit the Sayada is almost unbelievable. At the end of his life, looking back, he calculated that he had covered some 2,600 miles a year in his BMW, yeah. <laughs> on horseback, for 43 years. As he himself says, and I haven't, I haven't confirmed that he's right, because I, I, who am I to doubt his veracity? He says more than four times around the world. He traveled more than four times around the world to preach the gospel and to visit these young Christians in their societies, their sayadai often facing violent persecution on his journeys. Now then, I mentioned Howell Harris and Daniel Rowland. The direct impact of these leaders, the two of them and others, was largely limited to their own lifetime. But Panther Kelly's influence lives on today through his literary work. We can read his work today. We can sing his hymns today. He wrote important prose works that display his, 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 his extensive interests, his common sense, and his ability to give practical instruction to those newly born again. He was a poet of distinction, one of the great poets of Welsh literature, as seen especially in two long poems. One of them, Golo Gardairnas Christ, a view of Christ's kingdom is a vibrant exploration of Christ's sovereign rule 
over everything. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. The other, Bowed and Marola Theomemphis, the life and death of Theomemphis, traces the spiritual pilgrimage of a true Christian. It's a, it's a kind, it, it, it's, it, it doesn't follow Pilgrim's Progress, but it's a kind of Pilgrim's Progress in verse. He also wrote some 30 elegies. What's an elegy? Uh, not, not an allergy. <laughs> what's, what's, what's an elegy? It's in, it's in praise of somebody, usually, although sometimes he told the truth about people as well, right? When? When they, after they die, after they die, right? Um, he wrote some 30 elegies, funeral tributes in verse, um, in memory of other Methodists. But it's certainly in the case of Howell Harris, he could, he could put his finger on some of Howell Harris's failings, too. Very interesting. Um, and then, of course, there were his hymns. Eight volumes containing over 750 hymns in Welsh, two volumes with over 120 hymns in English. And they are not, they are not any old hymns. The Welsh hymns in particular, more than the English ones, the Welsh hymns are full of stirring, dramatic immediacy. Hunter Kellen is simply the greatest hymn writer in the history of Wales. And to my mind, he may well be the greatest hymn writer of all time and of all nations. He was also the most winsome of the Methodist leaders in Wales. He had a healthy interest in all aspects of God's creation. While he took his faith very seriously, he also knew how to laugh, sometimes to the consternation of Howell Harris. <laughs> Howell Harris didn't do laughing. <laughs> his marriage was exceptionally happy. Uh, something for the husbands and wives here this afternoon. In a little verse written for his wife, are you listening? He says that God should repay her handsomely for loving him, looking after him, being of a pleasant and uncontentious disposition. <laughs> and I'm not looking at anybody in particular <laughs> now. Huh? and forgiving a thousand more faults in him than were to be found in her. Now then, the husband's here this afternoon. Just a little challenge for you. Huh? What about writing a little verse in honor of your wife? He wrote in Welsh, so uh, you can't, that's, for most of you, that's no help to you. But it's a delightful little verse, and a challenge to you, all of you. He died in 1791, aged 74. Here on earth, journeying through this barren land, he had tasted the, the bread of heaven, the manna we heard about last night the manner of God's mercy, sustaining him, nourishing both body and soul. Through death, he entered the presence of the bread of life himself. Feed me till I want no more. His dying advice to all who visited him in his last illness says so much about him. Cleave unto the Lord with full purpose of heart. But what made him tick? What made Pantacellin tick? What was he all about? 
just before he died, he wrote uh, a letter to Thomas Charles, the famous Thomas Charles, the one you know about, the, the Mary Jones Thomas Charles, that one, right? He wrote to Thomas Charles that he had come to realize that true religion consists of three parts, three elements, all of which are so relevant today. Now, the first thing he notes is an understanding of God's way of salvation. As he puts it in this letter, true light regarding the plan of salvation. God's eternal covenant with his son to pay the debt of believing sinners. All the truths of the new covenant. He acknowledges the help of such eminent Puritans as John Owen and Thomas Goodwin in what he says, and this is fascinating, in enlivening his understanding of God's way of salvation. In other words, this was not something dry and arid and lifeless. It was vital. Understanding God's plan of salvation was, was, was vital. It stirred his whole being. And he shares it with us so vividly. Look at the first hymn on your, on your sheet there, the first two verses. In Eden, sad indeed that day, my countless blessings fled away. My crown fell in disgrace. Hang on, hang on. You, you, you weren't there. <laughs> you weren't born for thousands of years after that happened. Right? How can you speak like this? In Welsh, uh, the original words, an Eden covey of honeybeth in Eden. I, I remember it. How could he remember something when he wasn't there? What's he referring to? He was there, wasn't he? What does the Bible tell us? Where does the Bible tell us that Pantic Helen was there? And you were there? And you were there? Where? Romans chapter 5 from verse 12 on? We were in Adam. And when Adam fell, we fell. My countless blessings fled away. My crown fell in disgrace. I was there in person, in Adam. And what happened to Adam happened to me. Ah, but it doesn't stop there, does it? But on victorious Calvary, that crown was won again for me, won back for me. And so my life shall all be Praise. Faith, see the place and see the tree where heaven's prince, instead of me, was nailed to bear my shame. What do we have here? Substitutionary atonement. Instead of me. But this is not a mere theological proposition, is it? Pantacaran is there, faith, see the place, see the tree, and he brings us with him, he takes us with him. look, he says, that's where it happened, this is not just some kind of philosophical proposition, this is not just an, an idea that, that it, it, might, it might have happened, look, see the place, see the tree, it really did take place, Christ really was nailed to bear my shame. Look! Bruised was the dragon by the sun. Though two had wounds, they conquered one. And Jesus was his name. What's this all about? Where, where, where does Pantacallion get, get this teaching? Somebody said Genesis. Do you want to be more specific, Mr. Williams? Genesis 3, Genesis 3 verse 
Just yeah, stick on 15, if I will. Yes. <laughs> what, what's the technical term for it? The Proto-Evangelium, right? Yes, yes. Bruce was the dragon. But in Genesis, there's no mention of a dragon. What we have in Genesis? Serpent. What does Father Kellen do in talking about the dragon then? Revelation. Revelation. All right. In Revelation, John speaks of, 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 serp, uh, of Satan as, as the dragon. He's a serpent and he's a dragon and so much more. All right. So Bruce was the dragon by the sun. Though two had wounds, they conquered one. Yeah. Every time I read this or sing this, I can't help think of some of these old black and white films. Right? And you know, right at the very end, uh, the, the hero and the villain, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are in combat. Right? And, and everything is dark and you can't see what's happening and, and you know they are fighting each other and you, you, you can hear the, 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 the blows landing and you can hear the groans and the grunts and so on, and, and, but, but you can't see, you can't see who's winning. Right? It's all in the dark. And then suddenly, everything goes quiet. And you can hear somebody stumbling to his feet. And you think, who is it? Who's won? Who's the victor? Who? And you're not sure. There's, there's, this, there's this suspense. It, it, it's almost unbearable. Who is it? And then he puts the light on. And you see. And Jesus was his name. Doesn't it stir you? This is not just somebody stringing words together. Right. This is living theology. He had no new theology to offer. Rather, he was steeped in the biblical, covenantal theology of the Reformation and Puritanism. He says something very interesting in, the, in that last letter to Thomas Charles I mentioned. Okay. Any preachers? Yes, there are some preachers here. Yes, there are. Listen, listen. The Bible, which I used to read in a great measure for the edification of others, to get sermons to preach to others, I now apply entirely to myself as the only book by which I shall be tried in the great judgment. And although I have hundreds of books, I don't get the same enjoyment from any of them as I do from the Bible. Oh, his example is so valuable for us today in an age of uh, woolly thinking and theological dumbing down of, uh, of what we might call diet evangelicalism, or evangelicalism light, uh, spelt in a way that my English teachers in school would not have allowed me. Mm -hmm. And his example should stir us to join with him in heartfelt worship that has an impact on our entire being. What does he say? My life shall all be praise. So the first element of true religion, he says, is understanding God's way of salvation. In this letter, he says then, uh, the second element is fellowship with God. In his own words, maintaining intimate fellowship with God in all our dealings with the world and in all the exercises and ordinances of religion. And that has something to tell us, doesn't it? Right? How easy it is just to go through the motions, especially if you're a, a preacher, if you're a leader of any church, how easy it is just to go through the motions. But we need to maintain intimate fellowship with God in all our dealings with the world, the secular society in which we live, 
and in all the exercises and ordinances of religion. In other words, vital, vibrant Christian experience. He deals with this in the epic poem Theomemphis. Theomemphis is ups and downs. Right? Uh, and he deals with it in the famous book Jewish Society Proviat, um, translated by Mrs. Lloyd-Jones as the experience meeting. Right? This deals with uh, the Syat, what happened in the Syat, and how leaders of the Syat, he gives advice to leaders, uh, how are they to conduct the meetings, how are they to deal with different people, with different problems and different experiences, and so on. Uh, this is published by... Um, the Evangelical Movement of Wales, but I think it's out of print with, uh, with the movement. I think it may probably still be in print with um, Regent College Vancouver. They re republished it. In Syed after Syed, he helped so many young Christians, newly born again in revival, who had no biblical background, he helped them to understand and to learn from their experiences. But all this, his emphasis on fellowship with God, all this arose from Pantacellian's own experience of Christ himself. The predominant theme of his hymns, often using imagery drawn from the Song of Solomon, is the surpassing glory and amazing love of Jesus Christ. And the often ardent response of his own heart, and sometimes the weakness, the failings of his own heart in response to Christ's love for him. Through it all, he longs to respond in this heartfelt manner. Do I need to quote it? It's not down on your uh, leaflet there. Jesus, Jesus, all-sufficient, beyond telling is thy worth. Sums it up. Fellowship with God, a desire for Christ. What do we know of genuine spiritual experience? What do we know of the religious affections? I'm not talking of fickle emotions manufactured by music and lights and manipulative speakers. I'm speaking of the life of God in the soul of man. I'm speaking of genuine fellowship with God in Christ. Knowing God. Yes, something must be, must be known. An understanding of God's way of salvation but something must also be felt. Genuine fellowship with God himself. And then thirdly, firstly, understanding God's way of salvation. Secondly, fellowship with God. Thirdly, life and conduct, Williams Ponticelli says in this letter to Thomas Charles. That's the final part of true religion. Life and conduct an understanding of God's way of salvation and fellowship with God, they are vital elements in the Christian life. But that life has to be worked out in practice. And Pantacellian said about instructing uh, young Christians in a range of practical matters. He does so as he traces the, the ups and downs of Theomemphis' spiritual pilgrimage, the, the problems he encounters um, the holes in which he finds himself. Right? His prose works, Pantacellian's prose works, cover such subjects as money, jealousy, courtship and marriage, and the Christian's relationship with the world. His great desire for believers was that their lives should in every respect bring honor and glory to the Savior who had died for them. For Pantacalian, then, true religion consists of these three elements. Understanding God's plan of salvation, the doctrine, if you like. Fellowship with God, 
the experience, and God honoring living. How important this is today. When, when the concept of an evangelical is somehow often reduced to somebody who goes to a church where, the, where there are guitars and drums. Uh, in passing, perhaps I could uh, express my dismay that uh, the, uh, the guitars and drums affliction seems to have reached the conference here in Aberystwyth. Uh, I thought we'd been inoculated against that kind of thing, but it appears that the vaccine has lost its effect by now. Uh, ah, but we need to be in line with contemporary culture. Can't the Kellen and the other Methodist leaders had scant regard for conforming to contemporary culture? Ah, but we, we need, it's a help to, for our worship. Pante Kellen and the other men, they had no musical instruments at all. Was their, was their worship then inadequate? Was, was their worship impoverished as a result of that? If you're not sure, let me give you a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you could convey my dismay and sadness, Jeremy, to the committee that organizes the conference and recommend that they, would, they might like to reconsider this alien practice. But there we are. Martin Lloyd-Jones reminds us that in combining these three elements... Right? Experience, uh, doctrine, experience, and God honoring Christian living. Pantakelin was the embodiment of Welsh Calvinistic Methodism. Calvinism, the doctrine. Methodist. Well, back in the 18th century, Methodist uh, referred to somebody who was born again. Methodist was somebody who had, had an experience of God. Right? So the experience. Methodist. And then Methodist again, right? uh, expressing the, the methodical way in which a born-again believer brought all aspects of his life under Christ's lordship. Calvinistic Methodism Welsh Calvinistic Methodism is simply another name for true Christianity. The doctrine, the experience, and the working out in practice. And these three elements are combined most memorably of all, of course, in Pantakelion's hymns. Ah, the hymns. He was very much aware of the potential of singing in helping people to learn and remember scriptural truth. Why is it that we find difficulty remembering Scripture when we have no trouble whatsoever with the words of a song? You shouldn't have sat there, John Williams. You really shouldn't. All right? can, you, can you enlighten us? Can you quote to us the ironic blessing from Numbers chapter 6? The Lord bless you. Yes. 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 Good job in his wife sitting by him, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, not bad, actually. Not bad. Not bad. But then, perhaps I should ask his wife, can, can Rihanna quote Amazing Grace for me? First verse. That's 
You see the point? She didn't need any help from John there, did she? <laughs> All right? He needed help from her in quoting scripture, but she didn't need any help from him. All right? You can remember verses from hymns, but verses from scripture, uh, who's going to quote? Uh, oh, we, we, have a, we have an evening speaker with us, but I'd better not put him on the spot, had I? <laughs> who's going to quote um, Romans? Verse 11, chapter 33. All the depth, one, one of the most striking verses in the whole of the New Testament. All the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge, yes, of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, yes. <laughs> I think we're getting there. And, and his ways past, yeah. But, but, yeah. We can just about scrape home, can't we? Uh, but we, 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 know, we know secular songs much more effectively than that, don't we? Not just amazing, you know. We, um, I don't know what your taste is in music, right? Uh, but we do, have a, we do have a doctor here, right? Uh, I wonder if the doctor here can quote some right now. a spoonful of sugar <laughs> <laughs> helps the medicine. I'm not, it, it, come, come on, we need a doctor's voice. His, huh? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I didn't ask you to sing it, <laughs> but again, you see the point. We remember what we sing, right? But we have trouble in remembering verses of Scripture. Now, Panda Kelly understood this. And this is why his hymns are so valuable. He saw that hymns could be an instrument of immense benefit in instructing these young believers who knew nothing. Right? Giving them words to articulate their fears, their longings, their confidence, their guilt... Their praise, these hymns were in essence a confession of faith, a vibrant confession of faith for these raw Christians. And even today, they produce, they, so they provide us with a simple but vivid means of expression for our own poor, lisping, stammering tongues. But what makes the hymns so special is the compelling way in which Pantichelian combines the doctrine and the experience. The practical outworking in life and conduct is, is implied too, although it receives less specific attention. Think of our hymn books. In our hymn books, there are, there are doctrinal hymns that convey biblical truth Objectively, and they are superb. Mighty Christ from time eternal. Right? Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. Then there are hymns, including many of today's songs and choruses, that major on experience with very little doctrine. I need thee every hour. Yeah, well, you're quite right, but, but I suppose most gracious Lord is a sort of statement of doctrine, but that's about the only doctrine you find in the hymn. I'm not condemning the hymn. I'm not criticizing it. There, there are times when we all need to sing that particular hymn from the heart, but there's very little doctrine in it. Just, I need thee. Yes, and we, we do need him. But there's no, there's no real doctrine there. Panther Kelly's great achievement is to present in his hymns both the doctrinal and the experiential, the doctrine and the experience. He had an exalted view of Christ, and so hymns should reflect Christ's majesty in solid biblical theology joined with heartfelt experience, and leading then, resulting in a commitment to live to his glory. These three elements again, the doctrine, the experience, and the life and conduct. 
To put it simply, the hymns enlighten the mind, warm the heart, guide the feet. But what makes the hymns even more memorable is his striking gift for drawing us in to where he is. They don't offer some laid-back contemplation of theological propositions. Rather, as we saw with that first hymn, that we are there with him. We see what he sees. We feel what he feels. The dramatic immediacy of the hymns grips us, arrests us, places us there with him, sharing his failings and his fears, his rejoicings and his strengths. This is why they still speak so clearly and powerfully to us today. We've seen a few examples of this already. In closing, let's look at one or two more. Look at the next hymn on the sheet there. Awake, my soul. Don't sleep. This is no time for sleeping. This is no time for slumbering. Right? Don't even do think of dozing off. All right? <laughs> Awake, my soul, and rise amazed. All right? Don't be indifferent. Don't be lukewarm. Don't have some couldn't care less attitude. Rise amazed. And yonder see, we saw that in the, in the, in the other hymn, didn't we? All right? uh, see, look. It really happened. That's where it happened. Look at him. How hangs the mighty Savior God upon a cursed tree. Now, of course, the tree wasn't cursed, was it? But here's a poet, right? Poetic license. Who was cursed? Christ. Give me a verse. Galatians. Uh, <laughs> Galatians. Three. Yeah, I'll take a three, yes. Verse 13. Verse 13. Christ was made a curse for us. And in that sense, of course, it's the cursed tree, isn't it? All right? Where he hung on the cross. How gloriously fulfilled is that most ancient plan contrived in the eternal mind before the world began. Well, there are many verses uh, in the New Testament that, uh, that uh, uh, are a foundation for, for this verse here. Huh? here. Here is Pante Kelly's Calvinism. God saves sinners. We cannot save ourselves Thou must save, says Rock of Ages. Thou must save, and thou alone. If you don't save me, I have no hope whatsoever. God saves sinners. And then the result of that in the, in the third verse. Now hell in all her strength, her rage and boasted sway. Are we shaking in our boots, right? thinking of hell. It can never, it can never snatch a wandering sheep from Jesus' arms away. Where does he get that from? John 10, 27, 28, somewhere? Yeah, right. Isn't this thrilling? This is redemption accomplished and applied. This is biblical doctrine and what it means for me. The one who hung upon a cursed tree is in reality the mighty Savior God. In whose arms, through trusting him, I am safe for eternity. And he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Do you remember what happened just over a year ago? Uh, there was a football tournament in Europe. And believe it or not, the Wales football team reached the semi-finals. Uh, uh, which is uh, more than can be said of a, of a neighboring country. Huh? <laughs> uh, 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 with all due respect to our friend Mr. Morrison here, yes, of course, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't want to refer to Scotland at all. No, 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 no. 
thank you, John. Uh, what happened when the team came back? Right? There was a, a, a procession through the streets of Cardiff, open top bus and so on, streets of Cardiff lined with thousands and thousands of people cheering and singing and applauding and so on. And they didn't even win. <laughs> But here we are with Williams Pantichelli, cheering on our truly victorious Savior. All right? Look at the verse. Onward march, all conquering Jesus. Gird thee on thy mighty sword. Sinful earth can ne'er oppose thee. Hell itself quails at thy word. Thy great name is so exalted. Every foe shrinks back in fear. Terror creeps through all creation when it knows that thou art near. Not know whether you were in the crowd, applauding, cheering when the Welsh team came back. But we are in the crowd here with Pantichelli. We are with him. We are cheering on the one who really did win. All right? The one who was victorious on Calvary, the all-conquering Jesus. Isn't this exhilarating? Doesn't it galvanize your weary soul? Doesn't it drive away your doom and gloom? Ah, you say, but, uh, but my situation, uh, in Gorsainon, in Abaravan, all right. My situation is very different. To quote a number of Pantacalian hymns, all I can see is where I'm living, where I'm ministering, all I can see is the gloomy hills of darkness. Well, Pantacalli knew that. He believed that Jesus is indeed all conquering. But he also understood that for the Christian, Life on earth is an arduous journey through a barren land full of doubts, full of difficulties, full of discouragements. Where does the image come from? The exodus, the exodus. Right? Freed from the captivity in Egypt, but journeying through the wilderness of this world to the promised land. Panther Kellen was keenly aware of his own stumbling and faltering. It comes out in so many hymns. But he was no less aware that he had a glorious, all-conquering Savior. And so his failings, his fears, give way to faith in the living God. His ultimate destination is assured. Christ will bring him safely to the heavenly Canaan. And that brings us to our final hymn. The one you are most familiar with, I'm sure. Look at it. Only two verses here. There are three usually. There are five in the original Welsh. Right? Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I said the image came from um, the Exodus. Where else did it come from? Pilgrim, through this barren land. John Bunyan, John Bunyan. Pantagallion is familiar with John Bunyan's works. I am weak. I'll never make it on my own. I'm, I stumble, I fall, I get back up on my feet and I fall over again. I am weak. Ah, but thou art Mighty, hold me, hold me with thy powerful hand. If you hold me, right, you will bring me home. You'll take me there. Right? Every time I stumble, if you hold me, you will pick me up again. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. You can break, bring me safely through the wilderness of this sinful, fallen world. 
And when I tread the verge of Jordan, what's he talking about? Well, you remember the Israelites had to cross the River Jordan to get into Canaan, the Promised Land. And this is a picture. It's, it's very, very clear in Pilgrim's Progress. Right? Death is the, the river we have to cross, if you like, to enter heaven. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside. Ah, yes, John Wesley, our people die well very often, yes, and we give thanks for that. But sometimes Christians can be in severe pain. Sometimes the devil takes advantage of his last opportunity right, to get at the believer. Hunter Kellen is honest here, isn't he? Bid my anxious fears slip. None of us has died before. We're not quite sure. We're not absolutely sure what, what, what's going to happen. Bid my anxious fears subside. Death of death. That's who you are. That's who Christ is. And hell's destruction. Land me safe on Canaan's side. You can land me safe. Nobody else can. I'll never make it on my own. Other people can't help me, but you can land me safe from Canaan. You are the death of death. Where does he get that from? John Owen. John Owen. Right? What's the really important thing you should know about John Owen? Born in no, he wasn't, but he, he was, <laughs> but he was of Welsh descent. And, I, and, and I'll take that. I'll take that as a positive. All right? Yeah. John Owen, the death of death in the death of Christ. Where did John Owen get it from? Well, Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. Right? We are there on the, on the banks of the Jordan. We are there facing death. What is our hope in that hour, that moment? That Jesus Christ, the death of death, the one who is hell's destruction, that he will take our hand carry us through and land us safe on Canaan's side. And what will you do then? Songs of praises I will ever give to thee. Oh, it's so sad that those Christian students knew so little about William Spandekelly. Here is a man whose hymns can instruct us, comfort us, encourage us as we journey through this barren land. His hope lies not in himself, but in Jesus Christ, all-conquering Jesus. His entire being then, and ours, is to be devoted wholeheartedly to this wondrous, amazing incomparable saviour and the marvellous culmination of such a life will be to enjoy perfect fellowship that was the second element in the true religion fellowship with God perfect fellowship with him in heaven and to worship him for all eternity songs of praises I will ever give to thee. What a glorious Savior is presented so memorably in these hymns. What great salvation is to be found in Jesus Christ, even in the barren land of this fallen world. And what stirring instruction and encouragement for our churches and for each and every one of us here 